so we're going to talk about mass spectrometry today. Um, I think we're saved that NMR review um, when we get into doing carbon NMR next week or the week after. We'll start getting into carbon NMR, but for, and before we do that, we'll review proton NMR and how that all works. Um, for mass spectrometry, let me go ahead and get my um, screen share going. Um, for mass spectrometry, we're we're going to be talking a lot about um, basically mass spectrometry is not have to do necessarily with the local environment around a specific aspect. It's not about bonds vibrating and it's not about protons lining up magnetic fields or anything like that. It's actually a lot simpler on the surface, which is because it's basically just looking at how big various pieces are of the molecule. Um, so we're going to, it gives us a lot of information about the actual physical size of the different pieces of the molecules. Um, and let me make sure I've got the chat going too. Um, but first I did go through and, and uh, post the key to those nomenclature problems try to keep it as legible as possible. Um, none of, let's see, the, this one might have been, there's a couple of them where the direction that you count winds up having, um, changing what your name is. You can wind up with counting, um, for instance, you can count F, you can count decane two different ways, but the best way to count it is the way that keeps your branches as simple as possible. So for instance, you could count to 10 by going this direction. That gives you a decane. Um, and that would, that would be OK, except then wind up with two complicated branches, right? Two methyl ethyl groups. And so then we would have to have di, open parentheses, methyl ethyl, close parentheses, um, which just makes things more complicated. Uh, and instead, if you count this direction, that's still a decane, except that now we've got We've got more branches, but they're all simple. Not all of them are simpler. You still have one methyl ethyl or one isopropyl group, but then it's a dimethyl with an ethyl group as opposed to having two methyl ethyl groups. So that keeps our branches simpler. And so usually that's that's the preferred way to name them. Um, again, it, as long as you name it unambiguously, it wouldn't be totally incorrect if you named it the other way because I could I would still get to the right product or the right molecule if you gave me the other name that said dye which and it would be written probably something like um actually I'll just do it I'll do it just do it on PowerPoint rather than do it on the board be more legible that way um you could in theory write the name as if we went the other direction it would be, you have an isopropyl group on carbon three and carbon five, six. So it'd be three comma six dash di methyl ethyl close parentheses. And again, I'm, I'm fairly generous with the hyphens just to break it up into chunks that you can actually see what's going on. Um, a lot of places don't do that. So you would see everything run together as one, one word. Um, so that, that would then be dimethyl and then it would be on carbon four, there would be a methyl. So it'd be four methyl decane. Um, those are in theory, just as just as good names, those names would both get you to the structure, although we try not to do that if we can avoid it. 
or to have more than one thing in parentheses, if at all possible. Does that make sense? Um, oh, and I never did go back and assign priority for C, so I might as well do that. Priority would go one for chlorine, two for the direction that has the cyclohexyl, three for the isobutyl direction, and then the hydrogen that's behind would be four. So it's already into the board. So this would be, so when we count one, two, three, we're going counterclockwise, which would make this S. S, one cyclohexyl, five methyl, three chlorohexane. And this is another case where, you know, our longest continuous carbon chain is either the cyclohexyl group or it's the hexane, right? But it's a lot more convenient to call the hexane your parent molecule and then name the cyclohexyl group and the methyl and the chloro all as branches. Because otherwise, if you name it as cyclohexane, you have to name this entire thing as one big branch, which means within parentheses, um, which would get really messy and even more confusing. So picking your parent molecule carefully um, when you have more than one option is, a, is an important thing. And you see that as well uh, down here for H. If you count your heptane just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you get a weird complicated branch here. But if you count uh, in a way that makes it easier, you can count heptane going this way. That's also seven. And then we have one complicated branch and two simple branches, or even better, the way that I finally found would be if you start here and count all the way around that way then all of your branches are simple branches and you don't need to do any parentheses. Those are all heptanes though. So those are all the longest continuous carbon chain are still the same. Um, so, but this would be the best possible name in that case. Any questions on alkane stuff on, on these, this style? Sean, I was going to ask why G is a heptane and not an octane. Um, if you can count to an octane, then I probably just miscounted. One, two, three. And we can... one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, I just miscounted. Um, and then you wind up with diethyl. Instead of having a propyl group, you end up with a diethyl. So that makes sense. Um, that would be a better name for it then. Yeah, I found the same thing there too, Casey. Yeah. So then I was just going to say I should probably practice my assigning priority because I ran into difficulty, especially with the cyclohexane, the um, uh, RR cyclohexane or whatever. Just uh, confuse myself trying to assign priority. Okay, yeah, we'll go through that in one second. Let me just um, finish fixing this name here. So it's octane, and that makes it. We're going to have two methyl, three, five, diethyl, octane then. Um, as far as assigning priority for, remember that, that if you have a tie, but you have to try and do it again, except you have to take a different route. So if we're looking at this top carbon here, our lowest priority is going to be the one that's not shown is the hydrogen, right? And then we've got a methyl group, which is probably going to be our next lowest because then our other two options are both attach this big ring structure. So four for the hydrogen, three for the methyl. If we're looking at one direction around the ring versus the other, 
um, if we just went around the ring in each direction, you'd wind up with a tie, right? You'd go all the way around the ring and end up back where you were, and it'd be the same both ways. But if you go, if you have to take a different route the next time, you can get to another carbon if you go down. You go in two steps, you get to a different carbon, as opposed to you'd have to go all the way around the ring structure to get to another carbon if you went to the left. So in general, that your your instinct for this to be should be whatever looks the most complicated is probably going to be the higher priority, um, especially if it's all carbons. If you've got something else mixed in there um, with atomic different atomic numbers, you have to be careful with that because chlorine can look simple, but it's higher atomic number. But if it's all carbons, your higher priority is going to be the one direction that's more complicated. So then you get one, two, three, the hydrogens out of the picture because it's already in into the board. So when you draw your arrow, you're going clockwise. So R. Did that answer your question? Cool. Hey Sean, I actually have a question about C then. Okay. Wouldn't it be R? Because they're going from the alpha carbon going both ways, the the beta, or I think that's the proper nomenclature, but the, the second ones have two hydrogens, and the third one is attached to two hydrogens and a carbon, and then the other one on the right is attached to two carbons and a hydrogen. So wouldn't that make that higher priority? So you have to go all the way out to the end before you start trying to take a different path. And so if you go to the right, you get one step is a carbon, two steps a carbon, three steps is a carbon, and then you run into a hydrogen, right? The only step you can take from the third carbon would be to a hydrogen that's not going backward. Versus if you go the other way, you get one step is a carbon, two steps is a carbon, three steps is a carbon, four steps is also a carbon. So our tiebreaker is, okay, four steps away from our out from our um, chiral center is still a carbon, which is bigger than the hydrogen. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it does. But I felt, um, I mean, we can talk about this later, but I thought, because in the book, it, ta it talks about um, setting kind of like a priority, like the three, whatever each one is attached to, and then you compare them. Like it goes down like, and then, so the tiebreaker would actually be like when, when you like the third carbon out or the second carbon out has, is attached to two carbons and a hydrogen, whereas the other third carbon is attached to two hydrogens and a carbon. So technically the one on the right, I would think would be higher priority. So that's why I'm confused. I get what you're saying with the longer chain, yeah. but the book this, uses a This is method. ringing a bell. We, you and I had this conversation yeah, last yes, quarter. We did. So I need to double check that they didn't change how to teach this since, since I took this class. Um, because the way the way I learned it, the cyclohexyl direction would be higher priority because you're only looking at one atom at a time, um, not everything that's attached to that atom. You're looking at just one thing at a time. Um, but I'm remembering that you and I talked about this, and I did go back and look at it, and I may. So I might let me double check that. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. And yeah, I understand your logic with it, like the. Uh, cyclohexane is clearly larger, but just a different method. So that's why. So yeah, yeah. you can. Unless unless I go back out. and check, and I'll I'll tell everybody if I'm going to change that. Um, so assume that you're going the one step at a time approach. Unless I go back and find that I've been telling it to you wrong, and then we'll relearn it together. Um, but uh, start with it the way it is, the way we've been talking about it. All right, um, when it comes to the alkenes, the, the trickiest thing about these alkenes is to remember one, you're changing the suffix. It's not ane, it's ene, and you need to say where that double bond is. Um, and then you need to remember if there is an option where you could have two different stereoisomers, um, you need to make sure you specify which stereoisomer you're talking about. We use the same priority system that we use for R versus S. So here, 
Um, on the left hand side here, we have a methyl group and then a big mess of, uh, of a branch over here. This is bigger, more complicated. So this is the higher priority than the methyl group on the other side. On the flip side, on, sorry, on the other side of the alkene, you have an ethyl group, which is higher priority than a methyl group. So our two high priority groups are pointed 180 degrees from each other. So they're opposite each other. So that makes this E and Gagan. Um, the, the exception to that is if it's a ring structure, we're always going to assume that the ring structure goes in a nice, neat um, polygon shape, unless you're told otherwise. You can technically have, so this would be the Z, you technically can have an E cyclohexene, but it's super strained because you're you basically, if you think of the um, of the ring structure or of the alkene as being straight up and down, you have to twist things around and loop it around the other side, almost like a Mobius strip, um, to get them to be um, in the Z configuration. In fact, let me see. if Moldview will pull that up so we can see the 3D structure of what that would look like. Yeah, see, it's not even going to show up in here. Um, let's try cyclooctene. So cis like this would be cis cyclooctene. So I didn't let, load it properly as uh, as the trans conformer, um, because you can see that this alkene here still looks like a it's still the cis conformation. But you can see how when you get these larger ring structures, you could, in theory, have have the trans conformer where it's just the ring structure winds up being twisted around underneath and connected to the opposite side. Um, because this is a three dimensional structure. Um, and but that's it did not load. I'm kind of surprised. Um, Z. Yeah, it still won't load the the right three D structure there. Yeah, something that looks like that. It would be really weird looking and strained and not particularly stable. But in theory, you could you could see how you could twist these this thing around to connect both opposite sides. This is very much the exception. So with a ring structure, where I started with all this. With a ring structure, you don't need to say if, if the ring, if the alkene itself is cis or trans, it's assumed to be cis or Z unless otherwise specified. Um, you can wind up, the ring structures tend do wind up doing some interesting things um, to geometries. For instance, cyclooctyne is an alkyne, so it's a it's a carbon-carbon triple bond. Um, so the triple bond should be linear, but when you look at the actual 3D shape of it, you wind up with something that's bent a little bit 
outside of that linear structure because it's forced to be sort of twisted into that ring structure. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Here's here's our other good example of our tiebreaker when it comes to the priority. It doesn't matter how big the group is if it's if it's all carbons versus a chlorine chlorine is going to win that tiebreaker because it has a higher atomic number so it doesn't matter how big or long or complicated this branch over here is if it was something you know huge like that um, it doesn't matter because chlorine is bigger than the carbon right here the atomic number of chlorine is bigger than the atomic number of carbon which would make this E, even though the carbon chain looks is the cis conformation, our higher priority reagent or um, substituent are opposite of each other. All right. Um, finishing up the stuff that we ended with today. Um, so these are the same molecules for that we looked at for with acid catalyzed hydration for the quiz. If it's oxymercuration, demercuration, and that's the two steps here. This first step is the oxymercuration. And then the second step is the demercuration, where you're removing the mercury from it. Um, the net result is the same as high as the acid catalyzed hydration, except you can't rearrange things. Everything's stuck in this position. So this this is a lot more specific as to what products you're going to get. You're not going to have that sort of, well, you get a little bit of this product, but mostly this because it rearranges. You're going to see zero rearranging with this with this. Um, mechanism right. and so it's very similar to this to what we were looking at before except no hydride shift or so no methyl shift from either of these and so the really the key that you're looking for when it comes to determining whether you're you're which of those steps you're looking for is the other reactants. They're both an alkene reacting. It's just, is the alkene reacting with water plus an acid, or is it reacting with this mercury compound plus water? That's your, your clue. Okay, this one is not going to rearrange, is the fact that the mercury is there. Right, is this all making sense? It's one of these that seems simple enough until I throw three to three more variations of the same thing on top of it. <clears throat> and here's the last slide we, that I mentioned, but we didn't quite go over was if you use a nucleophile other than water, you don't add an OH group, just like with the acid catalyzed alcohol addition. If you use something that's not water, if you use that mercury compound plus ethanol, you don't add an OH group, you go to the same position where you would be adding an OH group normally, but instead you add this ethoxy group. Right, so that would be ethyl. Remember, ET is our shorthand for, for an ethyl group. So this would be the skeletal structure here. You're taking the oxygen from your ethanol and it's going to wind up getting attached to the more substituted carbon. And then you do a quick proton transfer to take the hydrogen off of the ethanol and you get this product over here. So the two pieces that we wind up with at the end, all of these carbons are still right where they were. We just broke the double bond and then we stuck this ethanol oxygen and attached it to the more substituted of the alkenes. And we'll get the same thing here. We still have the same carbons, 
but now our nucleophile, nucleophile can be a nitrogen as well. So we could have water as a nucleophile, we could have an alcohol as a nucleophile, we can have an amine as a nucleophile. In, that, in the amine case, it's still going to look like um, our nucleophile's lone pair attaches to the more substituted carbon. So we wind up with this is our, what's left of our nucleophile after we deprotonate, and the reactant carbons stay right where they were. You just break the pi bond. All right. So you just so in addition to watching for that mercury to tell you that you're doing where you're gonna, you're breaking you're going to do an addition reaction with no rearrangement. And then, if, but if it's not water that's reacting with it, you're going to be attaching something other than OH to that more substituted carbon. Right? Simple enough when I do it like this, it's easy to lose the details when I ask you on a quiz or when you see it on a test. So just pay attention to what's my nucleophile and is there going to be a rearrangement? Cody. Oh, yeah, the raise hand thing worked. I was just going to ask uh, if there's a limit to how big of a chain you can have on there. Can you do like a propoxy or? Yeah, you're, you're really only limited by whatever reactants you have in your stock room. If you used isopropanol, if you use isopropyl alcohol instead of ethanol, then instead of adding an ethoxy group, you'd be putting um, an isopropyl group on the other side of the oxygen here. So you're, you're really only limited by what your starting material is that you have access to. Um, ethanol, ethyl groups and methyl groups are the most common because you start getting more bigger than that and you wind up with things that don't dissolve well or wind up with a lot of side products or don't just don't mix and other things happening. Um, but there certainly there's no, there's no theoretical reason why you should be limited to just methyls and ethyls there. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could attach like, you know, two benzene rings or something with an oxygen. Sounds like you could. Yeah. Yes, you definitely can. Um, and in fact, this, I think this very reaction, um, except with instead of methyl, instead of ethylamine, if you use methylamine, is what um, the first, or is what that'd be the, I don't know, second or third. It's been a long time since I watched Breaking Bad. Um, but remember, there's a whole season of Breaking Bad where it was all about how do we, how do we steal enough methylamine? Um, and it was methylamine works because it allows you to add a nitrogen with a methyl group attached to it to a specific spot in a mechanism very similar to this. Um, so it winds up being a, a has its industrial uses as well in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals. All right, let's get into mass spec now. Now that we've uh, done a little bit of review, um, and mass spec is is again it's relatively straightforward as far as the, the information as you get, but it takes a little bit of practice to see what you're actually looking at. Um, and it's definitely one where we're going to basically play around with the different pieces and just you're just going to try and make fragments that have the right mass, that have the right number of protons and neutrons. Um, because all a mass spec does is it takes a, it takes your sample and it passes your sample in front of a really high energy electron um, beam. You just literally fire these super high energy electrons at your, at your compound. And when those electrons hit it, if they happen to hit it in the right way, you can knock another electron off of it. Um, and when you do that, you wind up making something that's now pretty unstable. Um, for instance, if we started with acetone over here on the left, if we fire an electron beam at it, we knock away one of the electrons. You, lone pairs are not as localized, and so lone pairs tend to get hit first. Um, but you knock off an electron, and you're left with this molecule that has a positive charge all of a sudden. And it's a free radical, so it's pretty unstable. Um, the advantage of this is that if you make something that is charged, it's going to respond to a magnetic field. Anything that's charged 
is going to be attracted to a another positive charge or repelled by sorry it's going to be repelled by a positive charge or attracted to a negative charge right and we can create that charge by using magnets to basically allow these charged particles to move to be accelerated either towards the negative side of a of a magnet or a, away from the positive side of a magnet um, and so what that actually looks like when we arranged this, when we arranged this, is, so here's one of the, the original um, devices. It was basically you fire your sample in here, hit it really hard with a bunch of electrons, and then you, you put it into this curved piece of glass where there's vacuum inside this entire piece of glass, so there's very little other molecules in the way. And this magnet basically allows you, if you vary the strength of this magnet, you can control what size of molecule actually makes it through this turn. Um, it's a little bit like if you were trying to, um, if you're trying to, you know, play the break when you're putting a golf ball. If you take the same golf ball, but you hit it harder, it doesn't break as much and you wind up missing. If you hit it not hard enough, it breaks too much and you miss the hole. But if you hit with just the right amount of force, then the angle of that hill is going to direct it into the hole, right? That's basically what's happening here, except instead of changing what the how hard you hit the ball, you change what the slope is of the green in real time by adjusting the strength of this magnet. And so you can basically scan through a bunch of different strengths. And then when, when the magnet, magnetic field is really weak, only the smallest particles are going to get um, curved enough to actually make it to the collector at the end. And as you increase the strength, the small molecules wind up missing and running into the glass wall up here. And the bigger molecules wind up moving, being in the, just the right direction. And so all we're measuring at the end is how much stuff is hitting the collector at the end. But by, by, tying that to how strong the magnetic field is when stuff is hitting, we can actually get an idea. So, okay, when the magnetic field was this strong, I got a peak, a bunch of stuff hit the collector. And then we increased it and nothing hit for a little bit. And then we hit another point where a bunch of stuff hit the collector. And so that results in, I'll go and I'll look at the animation here in a second, something that looks like this, where you have this this x axis is what's called mass over charge. It's based because anything that's charged, we can just run back the math and say, okay, something that has this mass in terms of AMUs, when you put it in this category or this um, strength of a magnetic field, should curve the correct amount to hit the collector. Right, so it's it's a little bit like some tricky, like a tricky physics calculation. Okay, what is the force that has to be on this object in order to get its velocity to accelerate at just the right angle in order to make it to the end of this long tube? Um, but the math, the math is tricky, but it's just math, it's just trig. Um, and so, you know, sines and cosines. And so you can actually calculate what the angle would be if you put a certain size molecule into a, this strength of magnetic field. Um, and so let me go back. The animation is actually really helpful. At least I find it really helpful. Still runs on Adobe Flash. Never did get updated. Whatever this. No, don't. No, I don't want to. Don't make me delete delete Flash. It worked last night. What's going on? Huh. This one. Uh, kind of. This one's a little bit. No, nope, that is the right one. Um, all right. Apparently, Mozilla updated over overnight, and now this is not going to work on me. 
Um, all right. Well, when we're when we're done talking about this, I'll see if I can find another good animation that that breaks it down. There's some good videos, um, but they're a little bit slower. Um, it all it all is going to come back to though we can we actually have a way of experimentally measuring how large these positively charged fragments are in terms of grams per mole. So when we get a atom, yeah, what's up? So I was just curious. So no matter what size of molecules they have, you have to adjust the magnet to get the whole spectrum of the, the molecule. It's not just like one go. And, and kind of, so in, right? Yeah, so we use electromagnets because that's typically easier than, in theory, what you could do is have one constant strength magnet and adjust the angle. Um, but it's hard to make strong, flexible tubing that can withstand these high vacuum um, pressures. And so it's easier to use an electromagnet where you, where you can adjust the magnetic field by adjusting the current and the electromagnet is a lot simpler in practice than trying to adjust the angle. But I mean, yeah, in theory, you could have, or you could also have just a whole bunch of mass specs that where every mass spec has a constant magnet and a specific angle and go through and test all of them. Say, okay, well on this one, this is the angle that corresponds to 15 grams per mole. And this is the one where the angle corresponds to 23 grams per mole. Um, it's just not as as universal if you did it that way. So um, the mag the using electromagnets is actually a really powerful tool in that in that way because you can fluctuate them however you want. Yeah, that does sound easier, but yeah, that's I would think that's some expensive equipment, but I'm sure you know. Um, it right is, although has this it. is one of the first modern pieces, first modern instruments that they that was designed back. Um, before NMR, probably before even IR was widely used, mass spec was used because they knew how to generate high energy electrons. And the math behind this hasn't really changed since I think probably Thompson's laws in of uh, electromagnetism, um, which would have been like the mid 1800s, I think Thompson, now a little bit later, late 1800s, um, when all of the, the laws of magnetism and, and electrical charge were became widely known. Um, and, and the nice thing about this is it also gives us, a, you know, one of the first things you guys learned to do in Gen Chem was figure out molecular weights, right? One of the first like chemistry things you learned after sig figs and conversions was, how do you figure out molecular weight? Well, you just add the pieces together, right? So if we have this thing, this, the units are technically it's mass, it's M over Z. Because if you actually wind up with an ion that has a plus two charge instead of a plus one charge, the magnetic field is twice as, as uh, important, right? Because you wind up um, with more acceleration. If you double the charge, you wind up with twice as much acceleration. So it's not technically just grams over moles, because if something had a plus two charge, it would show up as half the mass that it should be because it was accelerated twice as much if it had to double the charge, but that's gonna be the exception. For the most part, we can assume everything is gonna have a charge of one, um, but that's why we don't just write it in units of grams per mole. It's grams per mole per charge, technically. Um, and all of this spectrum shows us, sorry, Adam, did you have another question or are you good? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was good. I was just thinking about the what you just said with the twice acceleration. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I just uh, I forgot to lower your hand. So I was not sure oh, if you still had another one. <laughs> that answers my other question. How long does that last? So, so it stays there. there. Okay. Um, so all this is really telling us is if you take this random sample or this compound here, methyl, methyl butane, and you put it in in this mass spec, these are the pieces that have a charge when it comes through. The pieces that come through have these specific masses. So in other words, if we can just find a way to put all of these, put the pieces together to add up to these different chunks, that actually tells us a lot about the structure. Um, for one, the largest mass that you see 
is going to be the molecular weight of it's called what's called the um and i'm i'm going to try not to make the molecular ion some of these terms wind up sounding very similar to each other the molecular ion is just if you have your whole molecule and you just took away one electron so right off the bat this tells you the molecular weight of your compound whatever your parent, whatever your, your molecular ion is, whatever the largest major peak that you see is going to be the molecular weight of your compound. So right off the bat, that's kind of helpful, especially if you don't know what the structure is or what the formula is. At the very least, this tells you, hey, it's, the pieces have to add up to 72 grams per mole. Um, these other peaks are result are the result of uh, fragmentation, which is basically if we make this really unstable cation radical by knocking one electron off of it, what usually happens is it winds up splitting into smaller pieces. It kind of just breaks itself apart. Um, and so if you break break it into these different pieces, one of the sides of that of that one of the fragments is going to wind up having a charge usually and the other side is neutral but it's a free radical so you wind up with something for instance if you took acetone and you got this was your molecular ion where you just took one electron off of it this might then break up where into a case where um, one of the methyl groups breaks off as a radical and the you wind up with a positive charge left on one of the carbons on the other side. And so th these two pieces aren't going to both register as being the same mass as the, the original molecule, right? Because the part that actually has a charge on it is not as big as it was. So what's the mass of a methyl group? What's, what is the mass of this fragment that has a positive charge now? still just add up all the pieces, right? Two carbons, three hydrogens, and an oxygen. So, if, so we wind up missing 15. The mass of a methyl group, which is what I originally phrased it as, is 15. The mass of the ion is the mass of the original minus 15. So if I go back to that other, to that methyl butane here, there's another big peak at 57. 72 was our molecular ion. Then if you if you knock a methyl group off of it, you get a mass of 57. 57 is 72 minus a methyl group. And so we will frequently call it the if we call this the M for molecular ion, we'd la we could even just label this as M minus 15. Right, and that tells us the fact that it's 15 grams per mole different tells us that we probably lost a methyl group. And then if you look at the difference between, so here we got 57 and 43. The difference between those two is 14, right? So how do we get from, how do we get from to a mass of 43. Hmm. So methyl group, carbon, methyl group. So if a methyl group is a mass of 15, What's a mass of 14? A methyl group minus a hydrogen, right? Or a CH2? Mm. So this 43 fragment is going to be our starting molecule. Hmm. That we just sliced it right there. <clears throat> so in other words, it's like an isopropyl group. Is, has a mass of 43. Oh, 
So this, and then, so then what is the, what is 29 over here? Hmm. So if we split this so that the positive charge is on the left-hand side, we get a mass of 43 shows up on our detector. And the mm -hmm. ethyl group, we have an ethyl radical then, right? Well, conceivably, we could have the isopropyl group keep the radical and put the positive charge on an ethyl then, right? Hmm. Usually, wherever we're going to slice this up, if we could have put a positive charge on one side, whatever's left on the other side should also show up as a, as a fragment, right? So hmm. 29 is an ethyl group. It's 15 for the methyl plus the CH2. Is 14, uh, yeah. 15 and 14. Right, so a lot of these labeled peaks, what we have to do to figure out what the heck they are is sort of just take the, the molecule you're starting with and see, okay, if I chop it right here, this side is this mass and the other side is that mass. And they're going to tend to be related to each other by 15s and 14s or an isopropyl group falls off or if there was a bromine involved the bromine leaves and you wind up with a peak that just looks like your parent your molecular peak minus the bromine mm. right so it's again this is another one that's even even more so than nmr nmr has a lot of rules right but it's but when you know the rules um it gives you a lot of structure because there are a lot of rules. This one always felt like I was just making stuff up because, but if you're making stuff up from um, that adds up to the right mass that matches the other information, you know, you can assign these various peaks. So 15 is going to be a methyl group and minus 15 is our starting molecule without a methyl group. Cutting right here gives us 43 and 29. How could we get to 27? Get rid of two more hydrogens. Get rid of two more hydrogens. Is there an easy way to do that? Uh, if we cut we can't cut off two methyls so sometimes it gets a little bit tricky for some of these right because that's not entirely obvious right off the bat what's happening and it, sometimes there are other other less likely things to happen um, that tells like maybe it has this molecule has to go through an elimination where it loses two protons from the ethyl or from the isopropyl and you would wind up with something that looks like a propene ion so there can be other random stuff happening to some extent but for the most part you should be able to at least the most common peaks the biggest peaks in each of these clusters are going to be related to um are going to be related to something where you can just chop your starting molecule in one place. Um, and this actually could you do a uh, yeah sorry could you do a um, two plus carbon and a methyl for that twenty seven? So doubling. A two plus carbon or a three plus. I'm sorry. So three plus would be pretty unusual to have a plus three charge. A plus two charge would mean would mean that the actual mass would be instead of being 27, it would be 52. And 52 is still not that easy of a mass to get to here, right? If it if we cleanly could double this and wind up with something that we already had a big peak for. And that might be what it is. Oh, we knocked off two electrons instead of just one electron. So it's showing up as half the mass. Um, but because 52 is not showing up, I think mean, there's a little peak at 52 up here, but it's not a super, 
big peak, it would be unusual to have a plus two charge that was more common than the plus one charge associated there. But it's possible. And this that starts starts getting into it's a lot like a, the fingerprint region in IR. Um, this is actually how the the uh, machines that when you get your hand swiped at an airport, this is what they actually do. Is it just you get a bunch of just random stuff off of your hands, and they run it through a really cheap mass spec that doesn't have very good resolution. And they said, okay, well if it if it's got this molecular weight and it has these specific fragments that show up then there's a good chance it's a benzene ring with a nitro group attached to it. And if there's a benzene, gr benzene ring with a nitro group attached to it, that could be certain types of plastic or surf wax. It could also be TNT. Um, and so they, that's why you tend to get a lot of false positives because there's a lot of fragments that will give off the same masses, um, especially when you start looking at aromatic compounds. Because a benzene ring or a toluene plus a nitro group could be a lot of different things. Um, and if you look at these two, two um, components here, so this is our methyl, methyl butane we've been looking at versus pentane. They don't look identical, but they look really similar to each other, right? Um, they have a lot of the same peaks. The biggest difference is that on methyl butane 57, which is our M minus 15 peak, is a lot bigger than on pentane. And the reason for that is it actually comes back to our carbocation stability. Because if we chopped off a methyl group here and we're left with a positive charge, the that ion would look like butane with a plus charge right there, right? So secondary carbocation. Over here with pentane though, if we chopped off one of the methyls, we chopped off a, a mass of 15 there, a CH3 group, we're gonna be left with, still with butane, except it's a primary carbocation now, which is less like, which is less stable, right? So that peak at 57 doesn't show up as much in, on pentane as it does on methyl butane because the, the ion that we wind up making is more stable for methyl butane. And so those relative intensities can allow us to differentiate, okay, which of these two possibilities is more likely. Um, and this also might might give us some clues as to why that 27 shows up there. What could 27 be? Because 29 was more common with methyl butane because that that was that corresponded with slicing right here, right? And that was more stable because the ion that you would get out of that would look like this secondary carbocation, right? So if we tried to cut off an ethyl group here, we have the same problem. We wind up making a primary carbocation instead of a secondary. So how could we cut two, how could we have two more things broken off? It's probably because if you did wind up with, with the primary carbocation, it could wind up going through a quick elimination reaction, reacting with something else, and you wind up making some similar looking fragment that is still charged probably, because that gives us resonance, right? If we knock off a hydrogen from both of these to make a pi bond, all of a sudden we can resonate that positive charge, right? And so some of these wind up being like really high energy, unlikely things that you kind of just have to sort of guess. Some of them are really obvious. M minus 15, you just knocked off a methyl group. N minus 29, you just knocked off an ethyl group. Some of them require a little bit more creative thinking 
and we'll go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. Let's come back at five after, take 10 minutes, and then we'll talk about what this tiny little peak is up right there on each of these.
All right, go ahead and bring bring it back in here, guys. Um, while we're doing so, just a random figure that I've always found funny when it comes to describing the difference between SN1 and SN2 reactions. Um, SN1 reaction, cat waits for the other cat to leave the bed before the second cat joins. So that's our leaving group leaves first, and then our nucleophile comes in. The orange cat is our nucleophile in this cat. Gray cat is our leaving group. SN2, and if you've had more than one animal at the same time, you know, you know how this scene plays out. Um, in my house, it's usually either my kids chasing my dog out of her bed or my dog chasing the cat out of her bed. Um, but it looks a lot like this. Um, for whatever reason, my kids really, really like to lay the, the dog's bed almost has a permanent home on the couch because otherwise she's on the couch anyway. So at least then we can keep her on her bed and not on the blankets and pillows. Um, but my kids really like the dog's bed. It's like shaped right or maybe just smells like the dog or something. The kids are always cuddling up with their blankets in the dog's bed and then the dog lays in my chair instead. So there's a lot of uh, substitution reactions happening um in the early morning hours in my house um all right so thus far with mass spec what we have is it tells us your molecular weight for your compound right pretty easily you just look at what the biggest chunk is that's in, up there um and you will notice though that there are around each of these major fragments there's a bunch of other smaller stuff and those are things that are less likely to happen, but maybe it's random stuff like, okay, well, the M minus 15 peak is losing a methyl, but then maybe these other small ones around it are losing a methyl and a hydrogen. Or going through a, a one of these little, these um, less likely uh, elimination reactions to take another two off, All right? So it's still just random things happening because these are really high energy systems. And so they're always going to go through a lot of different possible reactions, which is why we get so many different peaks here. The ones that are most likely are the ones that have the highest peak here, and they call that the relative abundance of, the, of that fragment. And whichever one is the largest in terms of, uh, we always just set that at 100%. Um, and that's what's recalled, referred to as the base peak. And so your base peak is not your molecular ion. That's the one I was trying to be very careful not to mix up earlier. Um, the base peak is just whatever you have the most of, whatever you have the highest spike there, because that's the, going to be the, the most likely fragment that you see. And in both of these cases, we see that it's that 43, which is the uh, minus a methyl or minus an ethyl group. Right, and so there's there are reasons why the methyl group is bigger. is a lot more common to lose a methyl group in terms of the methyl butane relative to the pentane, but losing an ethyl group is pretty common for both of them. Um, and so that's what our base peak is. They're the same base peak for each of these, and it's the same um, molecular ion size for both of them because they have, both have the same molecular weight when they're before they're ionized. Um, the other thing, so this tells us a lot about how it breaks apart, how big it is to start. The other thing that we can actually estimate from this um, is by using these little tiny peaks that show up just above the molecular ion. Um, and you can barely see them, but they wind up being somewhat significant. Uh, and I happened to, I missed and I circled over it right there, but there's another little one there. Um, and what that peak is, is it's actually what happens if instead of all of your carbons being carbon 12, what if you happen to have a carbon 13 mixed in there? So about 1% of carbons don't have a mass of 12, right? They have a mass of 13 instead. 
And so that means that there's a there's a measurable probability that you actually get something, um, a compound that's not a mass of 72, it's a mass of 73. But it only happens, only about 1% of carbons are carbon 13. And so you wind up with a really small peak just above your molecular ion. Um, and so that's, um, we're going to see that in pretty much everything, because in OCHEM we deal with almost all, everything has carbon in it, right? And so there's almost always going to be some um, amount of carbon-13. But we can actually use the height of the tiny carbon-13 peak. We call it the M plus 1 peak. Um, how big that is relative to the molecular ion peak can actually tell us how many carbons we have. Because if we have five carbons in this compound and each one of those carbons has a 1% chance of being carbon-13, the probability that we randomly grabbed a molecule that has that where one of the five is a carbon 13 is five times greater than the probability of any individual carbon, right? Because it could be carbon one that's the carbon 13. There's a 1% chance of that. There's also a 1% chance that it's carbon two. There's also a 1% chance that it's carbon three. And so the size of these peaks relative to our, our um, molecular ion peak will actually tell us how many carbons we have um, in addition to just telling us the molecular weight because if we wind up with something where the the m plus one peak um, is let's say it's 12 or let's yeah let's call it 11 percent of our um, the size of our M peak. Well, so each carbon has a 1.1% 1, 1 chance of being carbon 13, right? So if you wind up with, with that peak, that's 11% the size of the molecular ion peak, that tells you you must have 10 carbons, or you likely have 10 carbons. Right, and so the larger your molecule is, the more carbons your molecule has, the larger that peak will get. And it's gonna be in this, this form of N, the number of carbons times the probability of each one being carbon 13, which would be 0 0.0111, one, depending on how many sig figs we have. That's gonna, that's going to give you the um, relative fraction. So if we had 10, we'd wind up with it being 10% the size. If it was, if we had 20 carbons, we'd wind up with it being 20% the size of the mass of the M peak. And so with carbons, that's, that's kind of a small percentage, that 1.11%. Um, and it's kind of useful, but can also sort of get lost in, you know, it's really hard to evaluate that if you don't have a lot of um, a very big signal there, it'd be kind of hard without being given numbers to know what that ratio was. Um, but these isotope effects do show up in other ways too, that actually give us really, really good information about what, I, what mo well, not just what ions there are, but what um, elements are present. So, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen all have very, very small percentages for the isotope effects, right? If you look at these, 0.01% of the hydrogens are deuterium. So that's not going to be a measurable amount. 0.3, all of these with nitrogen 15, oxygen 17, oxygen 18, they're all less than 1%. So they're all going to be such small probabilities that you get one of those that you can more or less just they're they're not really going to affect any of our answers. Um, however, sulfur shows up with this four percent. That's that's even bigger, and it shows up two numbers above the normal um, the normal isotope. So if you get something, if you get a significant chunk that's still kind of small, but it's at M plus two instead of M plus one, 
you might have a sulfur present. Even more likely or more helpful are these two, bromine and chlorine, because these percentages, there's a 25% chance that you get something that's two units bigger than chlorine is normally. And there's some there's a 50% chance that you get a bromine that's two units bigger than it's supposed to be. And so th those show up with really characteristic, they call them isotopic patterns. So for instance, if we look at this compound, and we look up at the parent or at the um, molecular peaks up here, we have a big peak at 122, a small peak right above that. That's probably the carbon 13 peak. But then we have another peak that's at M plus two that's almost the exact same size. Well, since all of our bromines have a 50 50 shot at being bromine 79 or bromine 81, that tells us that we probably have a bromine here. And it also helps us with some of the fragments too, right? Because if you look at 43, mass of 43 and mass of 41, those aren't the same size, right? So they might be two, two mass units apart, but that, those two fragments don't have a bromine in them. Because if there was a bromine, you would expect to have a similar peak, that peak that's the exact, almost the exact same height, height, two units away from it. And if you look at 122 and 124, 122 minus 79 is what? One twenty two minus seventy nine is forty three. And one twenty four minus eighty one is also forty three, right? So this forty three chunk here corresponds to our original molecule minus a bromine. And if it doesn't have the bromine in it anymore, it doesn't have the two bromine pattern. And then you'll notice that these are very familiar numbers, right? 15, 27, 41, 43. 43 was our isopropyl group, wasn't it? And 27 was our, was an ethyl group minus two hydrogens. So we have lots of different pieces that start, so lots of similar numbers that start showing up. Adam? Josh, I, maybe I'm thinking about this wrong, but shouldn't the 41 and 43 be even as well? If, if it's a 50-50 chance, isn't the, that's why I'm like, shouldn't the amount of molecules be 50-50 as well? Once right, they so, lose that bromine or no? So, but, if you start with the bromine 81, then your starting mass was at 124, right? Right. And then if you started, and then if you lose that 81, you get to a mass of 43. Wait, let me start, rephrase. Okay. Maybe I, I meant, shouldn't the ratios of 41 and 43 be even? Only if it still had the bromine in it. Okay. Because because if you don't have the bromine in it, the bromine itself is what has that 50-50 shot, right? Right. But you remove you have to remove a bromine to go from 124 to 43. You remove a bromine 81. And if you take 122 and you remove bromine 79 from it, you also get 43. Oh. Okay. So because we took away that. the bromine both of those, there's 50-50 shot to start, whether your molecule had bromine 80, not 81 or 79, but regardless of which bromine isotope it started with, when you take it away, you get 43. Right, yeah, that makes sense. I think for some reason I was counting the 41 as 
the um, subtracting the the larger isotope, the eighty one. Right, from, you would get forty one if you subtracted eighty one. Right, but you can't have a bromine eighty one on one twenty two. Right. right, I'm saying okay, yep. Um, and that's but that's exactly what you want to look for, right? These two peaks are right are two units apart, so your thought should start as. Um, as okay, well, is that still bromine? Is bromine still there? And if they were the same size, you might think that, except for the fact that bromine is bigger than either of those, right? You notice we don't have hardly anything. You have a couple peaks down here around 80. They would correspond to probably the bromine being by itself, the bromine being knocked off and being by itself. So you have a peak at 79 and a peak at 81. And these peaks at, at 80 and 82, It'd be tough to say exactly what that is. Could be some really random something happening. Could be it could be um, making a, a hydrogen bromide molecule. A hydrogen bromide molecule with with bromine seventy nine would give you a mass of eighty. Hydrogen bromide molecule with a bromine eighty one would give you a mass of eighty two. So probably these four chunks here are brom bromide and hydrogen bromide. But if bromine weighs that much, nothing down here can actually have any bromine in it. Bromine has to weigh more than that. Yeah, I see that now, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Um, if we had something similar where instead of having equal peaks, we had them in a three, three to one ratio, then that would tell us that we probably have a chlorine present. These are the two isotopes that have where you have the the most significant and recognizable isotope patterns, right? Because you should have three times as much chlorine 35 as 37, and you have that 50-50 ratio if it's bromines. Um, and it also means, well, usually if you have an halide present, the, the lone pair electrons are most delocalized. They're the most spread out, which means they're also the most likely to be hit by that electron stream that knocks stuff off. And so with that in mind, um, and then they're also pretty good leaving groups as well. So typically, if you have an alkyl halide, your parent, your, your um, molecular ion peak is not going to be very big because the first thing that happens is your halide gets hit with the electron and then leaves. And so your, your base peak is usually going to be the mass of whatever you had minus the halide, which is what we see here, right, Cody? Oh, okay. Um, so that winds up being true of, of more than just with bromine. You see that with chlorine, you see that with iodine as well. Um, iodine is really distinctive because it only has one isotope, but it's really, really big, right? Iodine weighs, what's the mass of iodine? It's like 127. Um, and so if you have a really big molecule and that has nothing below it, for 127 units below the, the um, uh, molecular ion, then you odds are that difference, you're gonna have a peak at, at M and then you're gonna have a peak at M minus 127. And that's probably gonna be your biggest peak is gonna be M minus 127. That's a really, really good clue that you had iodine present. All right, and so we frequently will see, and it's, it really is, while you're getting the hanging mass spec, we'll do a lot of exercises like this, where it's less about figuring something out from an unknown um, and more about, okay, here is the compound. What, what can you do to explain all of these numbered peaks? And again, you're going to see some that are really common numbers. 43 shows up again, right? And remember, if your if your molecular ion is most likely to be this molecule, 
where you wind up knocking an electron off of a lone pair. Lone pairs are the easiest targets to hit. So, and when you wind up with this starting, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to wind up splitting it into two pieces where one side keeps the charge, the other side keeps the radical. So what does that 43 correspond to? It's an isopropyl group, right? So that'd be our isopropyl group. And, that, and remember, if they're showing up here, that means that they have the charge. So what happened is we split it right here and we left with the isopropyl group. And then we got a hydrogen here at the plus charge. And then you have to remember that the other piece of that is the oxygen that now is a free radical. and then fill in the hydrogens, right? Those would be our two, our two most common fragments because if 43 is our base peak, is our most likely peak to have a charge, the other, the remaining chunk is gonna look like this. And that's, that makes sense that this is more common, right? Because oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, right? So if you have to choose between one of them gets to keep the extra electron and the other one gets a positive charge, it makes sense that oxygen keeps the radical, right? And it, but that uh, we are, like I said, we are dealing with high energy systems that are pretty short lived. So there's also the possibility that it goes the other way. There's a finite probability that you wind up making the opposite happen, where you put a positive charge on the oxygen and this, and you get a propyl radical. A propyl radical is not gonna show up on our mass spec, right? Because it doesn't have a charge. You have to have a charge for it to be affected by the magnet, right? So radicals don't get affected by the charge, so they don't show up. But, cations do. So if we cut it the other way, so 116 minus 43 is what? 87? No, that's not right. We might see a peak at 73? Nope. Nothing there though, right? So that tells us maybe there isn't as high a probability of it splitting the other way. Maybe oxygen is never going to let carbon keep the electron. But we could maybe, what if we split it on the other side? If we split it on that side and the oxygen keeps the radical, then we wind up with this section having a positive charge. In fact, let me, let's switch the color here. So this fragment, if you had a butyl fragment with a positive charge, we would expect that to be 14 higher than the isopropyl, right? So that's our 57 peak. If we add up the mass there, that's what we get. Okay, so here are our two that we've got assigned so far. 
So that one's going to look like positive charge there. 40, and you'll notice 41 shows up right underneath 43 again, right? So that's that propyl, that propyl ion going through a, a um, some sort of elimination where you're going to wind up making, it still has to have a positive charge for it to show up but you will frequently see 41 and 43 right next to each other, both in significant amounts because um, a 41 winds up being a pretty stable molecule. Because if we wound up with an elimination happening that could give us this, that's a mass of 41 and that's got resonance. So it's pretty stable. But you see how we're just kind of like, putting together pieces, you know, I, the easy ones are the ones where you can cut it in one spot and one side of it gives you a nice clean number um, or where you see a nice clean number like M minus 15. M minus 15 should be, start, should get really familiar, right? Because M minus 15 is always your starting molecule minus a methyl. Um, 87, so a lot of times, and like I said, a lot of times it's um, with the bigger pieces, especially, it's helpful to see what's missing. So if you take 116 minus 87, we get a 20, we get, this is our M minus 29. So what's M minus 29? Got rid of an ethyl group. We got rid of an ethyl group. Since we only have one good ethyl group, it's probably this one. Because we can't cut an ethyl off of the isopropyl side easily, right? Not by just breaking one bond. All right, so in a lot of ways, there's a lot of ran randomness and sort of like, you know, fudging the numbers till it makes hand wave and say, well, it's probably, this is probably what that chunk looks like. And I'm not sure exactly how it got there, but it's going to be something that looks kind of like this. But it's all just masses that we're putting together. And the isotope effects can be confusing, but they're also really not that important under normal circumstances. The isotope effects are really useful to say, oh, I definitely have a bromine. But beyond that, you don't need to worry about them too much. It's more about just, okay, how do I chop this up and get the right, the right cuts of meat, basically, for what shows up here? Cody, what can I do for you? Uh... Is it safe to say that you're only going to cleave one bond at a time with this stuff? Or? You're going to start usually with one bond. And then if you make something super unstable, it might then do another rearrangement. If it, if you can, like these, these little, um, um, you know, making that little elimination reaction to make from the, from the isopropyl um, is certainly a possibility. Um, so they, they can do that. They, your most, your biggest groups, your biggest peaks are typically going to be only cutting in one place because there, that's going to be the most likely thing to happen. Cause if you need two things to happen in a row, that's, there's a lower chance statistically of that happening, right? Even if each of those events is, is likely on its own, the odds that they both happen, um, you know, if I say, uh, if you roll two, two D6s, if you roll two uh, six-sided die, and I just say, okay, you have to get both times, you have to get a number that's greater than one. Well, the fact that I said both times, like, okay, yeah, they, you got a, a really good odds of getting it right the first time, but then the odds you have of getting both of, having both of them happen, even if both of those things are likely, the odds of both of them happening drop significantly. So that would be what an eighty-one six or five sixth 
is I should have picked easier numbers. Eighty three percent. So you have an eighty three percent chance of of rolling a two or higher the first time. But then if you square that, it's only a seventy percent chance of rolling yeah. of rolling above a one. I yeah, I think I phrased that wrong, right? Because we're cutting this apart multiple different ways, but yeah. So statistically only only one electron is getting knocked off though. And if only one electron is getting knocked off, the second thing that's likely to happen, the second cleavage that's likely to happen is going to be a result of that really unstable thing that we made rearranging itself somehow. Does that make sense? But yeah, but the, the odds of actually knocking two electrons off of the same molecule are pretty low, though. And that's why we don't wind up with that, where we don't have to worry about that over Z very much. We can usually just treat Z as one because we only have a charge of one on these typically. Adam? So if we're not um, doing more than one at a time, like, so we're talking about the rearrangement or the elimination reaction. What would cause that elimination reaction? What's gonna pull that hydrogen off then? It could be running into something else, and it or it could just be you know, make you can even make a hydrogen gas molecule, and you wind up with two things that are more stable because you wind up making a hydrogen gas H two, which is not unstable, and then you all of a sudden go from from a carbocation to a carbocation with resonance, which is way more stable. So it's it's a combination of things, and some of them. There's a lot of possibilities, which is why we don't try to assign all of these peaks. Um, and, and sometimes it's, you know, there are some really common patterns that wind up showing up a lot, um, which is why the, um, I uploaded a, um, the chapter on this from, I think I put this one. Yeah. Um, this chapter on mass spectrometry that I uploaded for you guys is like 30 pages long um, for something that we just covered in like 10 slides. Um, and a big chunk of that is because it goes into more detail about, um, okay, uh, where are the fragmentation cleavage, cleavage patterns? Um, other cleavage processes, like, okay, there's your 15, there's 29, there's 43, 43 is a propyl group. Um, but then it also says, okay, if you, let's see, you should see, where do they talk about 41? There we go. If you manage to get it to go, if you cleave it in such a way that you make something that goes through then an elimination process, then that's how we got that. And so it actually goes into some of the more common somewhat random cleavages that you could have. Um, for instance, the propyl group turning into a propenyl group or ion where you have that, that elimination has happened. Um, and that's, that's just such a common, that one shows up all over the time. If you make a propyl group, a propyl cation, you, you will see a peak at 43 and almost always you'll see a peak that's almost as big or bigger at 41 right below it. Um, and it's just, there's all sorts of other random crap that happens. You don't, you never have a perfect vacuum. There's other stuff in there. Um, depending on what the compound is and what impurities are in it, you might, that might be what causes 41 to be bigger than 43 sometimes. Um, the, it's, it's important not to get too focused on getting like an exact mechanism for each of these pathways because sometimes it's just it's not something you could have predicted but he's like well this looks a lot like this other fragment that i have over here if i just you know did this to it if i just broke this ring up into pieces into multiple pieces instead of got one bond maybe it does cleave two bonds because it just that makes the whole ring fall apart and that's um, how I can get pieces that are the right, the right mass. Um, and it's something that takes a lot of practice. And this is not something that I spent as much time on in 
in college or grad school as um, NMR. So if I get a little bit more hand wavy on, on mass spec, it's because I don't know it as well as I do for NMR. Um, um, but that's, that's really what it comes down to what we're going to practice. And the, the important thing to remember is that every compound is going to have its own unique NMR. Or sorry, not NMR. I'm trying to go to NMR right now because I'd rather talk about NMR, but um, mass spec is going to have, every compound is going to have its own unique mass spec that's like a fingerprint. Especially, not just what size the fragments are, but what ratios they show up in as well. And that's why the airport security is all screwy with that because they don't do the ratios. They're set, their instruments aren't sensitive enough to actually pick up the ratios properly. It just says, hey, you get a hit at this fragment, this fragment, that fragment. And that's that's very similar to something that we know is, a, is an explosive. Therefore, search this person. Um, and you will get false positives from those for that reason. And you will also get positive positives for really trace amounts of things. Um, I remember in particular, my dad, my dad's uh, career is working. He worked in uh, claims adjusting for insurance agencies where he would go out and inspect losses. I um, mean, he had to he had to inspect a loss in a mine where they were using dynamite. Um, and he got he got the third degree trying to come through security um, on his way back because he had dynamite residue on his hands. It's like no matter what he could do to wash his hands off, he just had a little enough of it that it set that thing off. Um, so they're pretty sensitive and pretty accurate, but they also give false positives a lot, um, which is why they then have to search you and find something before they could actually arrest you. Because just being around somebody else who was around dynamite would, would be enough to you could set off airport security, especially if they think you're suspicious for other reasons as well. Um, and I I believe that uh, so drugs will show up in that as well, but I believe TSA is actually forbidden from using those to detect trace amounts of drugs. Um, airport police can arrest you for things like that, but those machines, they can't like, oh, you tested positive. You know, you have a positive result for cocaine. We're going to detain you indefinitely um, because TSA is founded to protect safety, not police drug trafficking. It's a fine line, but they're actually, I don't think they have the jurisdiction to do that. They will just hold you until police come. Um, and then the actual police would actually then pursue that in theory. Um, which is, you know, a whole digression that's not all that relevant for what we're doing right now. But it, it is interesting how our government agencies work and don't work together. Um, all right. I'm glad you went on that tangent. I was trying to think of practical applications for mass spec. It's and it's really it's really simple and relatively cheap. It's really it's really expensive to get one that has these peaks with the heights, but to just get one that shows up with there's something at 43, something at 87, something at 101 is really cheap for them to make. I um, mean, you can make them pretty compact too. Um, because we actually get, you can actually get a lot more, um, instead of just using a curved piece of glass, you can use what's called a quadrupole mass spec, where instead of it needing to make a certain angle turn, um, if you adjust how rapidly your electromagnets switch between different polarities, you can control whether or not it stays in between these four magnets or whether it flies off to the side like down here. And so that, and those now, now just making, all you really have to do is you can have a straight line. You don't need an angle at all. You can have a straight chamber that just has these four poles in it that you just alternate really quickly what the charges are on those poles. And that can give you a way to, they call that, like I said, a quadrupole, like quadruple, but instead of, at the end, it's P-O-L-E, like a pole of a magnet. Um, that one right there, I think that that was just made up by some clever um, person who who saw the, the opportunity for a pun, and they took it. Um, 
uh, yeah, these are some good animations too. Kind of hand drawn, but. Anyway, and this is showing the scan that as you change it, you get different compounds making it through to the end to hit the detector. Yeah, I can see where cost would be an important aspect. I was looking at NMRs and those get quite expensive. Yeah, it's especially if you want like the really high resolution NMRs um, actually run on, they, um, they don't use liquid nitrogen like we were talking about earlier. They use liquid helium, which boils at four Kelvin. Um, and so, and liquid helium is really expensive and dangerous on its own. You actually have to cool down the tube that you put the, li the liquid helium in. You actually have to cool that down with liquid nitrogen. Otherwise, when liquid helium hits room temperature, it vaporizes so quickly and so violently that it explodes. Um, because that's all, that's all an explosion is, is a ra rapid expansion of gas. Um, yeah, the liquid helium NMRs can get up into the 250K range um, pretty quickly. And that's, that's what, and then all an MRI is, of course, is a one of those that's big enough to put a person inside instead of just a molecule. And so that's why MRIs are so expensive as well, because um, they're running on similar, similar um, constraints. But mass spec, you just need, small amount of your compound and you need some magnets and you need a detector electron source but that's just electricity usually um so what we're working on what your assignment actually is i'll turn you loose on your assignment now that we um let's see um Where did it go? Um, the assignment is basically just some practice problems with these, where you define some vocab terms, um, practice with a couple of these, and then the last part of it is is a qualitative one where I give you an IR and a mass spec, and you're trying to have to try and figure out what it is. Um, that's so that's going to be the trickiest one, of course. Um, but you have until next. I believe I said the the. I'm experimenting with when I put the due dates. Um, everybody always says they like having the weekends to work on things, but I've noticed that people get more stuff turned in and don't get over as overwhelmed when I make due dates on Fridays instead, um, because the tendency over the weekend is to forget that you have it. And then, especially with the quiz on top of it. Um, so it's only, it's two questions or two pages of questions. The first page should be, you know, some vocab, explain why his peak shows up at 77, and then match these four compounds to the right mass spec below. Um, and then the last one, number four, is here's an IR, here's a mass spec, the same compound, what is it? Um, so right now the due date is listed as Friday at midnight. If we get closer to it and you guys are panicked or you want and you want more time, um, you guys are mature enough. I trust you not to forget you have an assignment for the most part. So I have, I'm okay pushing it back to Tuesday. The Gen Chemers really, really do a lot better when I make due dates on Fridays instead of on Tuesdays. Um, so I have it like that for right now, but I have no problem changing it if pushing it if uh, if the assignment winds up taking longer than I think it will. All right, so. Just let me know about that. I'll keep grading your um, qu your quizzes too. I'm almost done. Helps that there's only 11 of you. Um, and then um, other than that, feel free to hang out and work on this in here. I'll keep this room open till four. Um, if as long as people are here, if everybody leaves, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna call it. But um, other than that. I will see you guys on uh, on Thursday. So head out whenever you're feeling comfortable. Thanks, Sean. No problem. I'm going to stop recording.